Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and today I have a video for you guys from Seth the Programmer. Now, this is a video talking about the uh, Goku versus Moro fight in defense of Goku versus Moro. Now, I when it comes to the Moro arc in general, I am honestly not not really a big fan of it. I I'm someone who thought that it started out good. I was really, really interested, especially in Moro as a villain, when it was introduced what he actually was and what he could do. I was, again, I was really, really interested because I thought, you know, this is a different kind of villain. And I was really curious to see exactly how Goku and Vegeta were going to deal with him. And for a while, it seemed like it was going to start off pretty interesting and, and on a pretty strong note with some bumps on the road. But unfortunately, it just completely fell apart. I mean, for me, the uh, the the final part of the story that had, takes place on Earth just completely ruined it for me. I mean, it's just the, the the whole thing with Goku and you've got the Senzu Bean and Vegeta who trained on Yardride and you think it was going to amount to something and amounted to nothing. It's just it, it just completely fell apart and it just went back to being just generic shit that we've seen in this series over and over and over again which I, again if you're okay with that then hey more power to you but for me it's just what again like i said one of the things that i really found interesting about the moral arc is that i thought it was going to be something a bit different i thought that they were finally changing up the formula but they just went back to doing what they've always done and yeah i just it, it completely fell apart for me now i'm curious to hear what seth has to say in defense of Goku versus Moro. So let's go ahead and watch this now. Oh boy, it's an anime clip. Uh, just just for safety, I'm gonna lower the volume. Hello everyone, it's your host, Seth the Programmer. And today mm -hmm. we're going to be doing another narrative analysis video on Dragon Ball. This one in particular will be in defense of just, Goku versus Moro. Just until the music Ball. passes by. A few things leading up to it. Now, I'm not here to try and preach that Dragon Ball is the greatest written thing of all time. But it's I'm not. really tired of people acting like it doesn't have any good writing qualities whatsoever and just treating it like an Ooga Booga manga and nothing else. Okay. If you guys do like this breakdown, I did do a breakdown of every other arc of Dragon Ball in my The Strength of Son Goku video, which a lot of people say... I mean, on that point, I know, I don't think that Dragon Ball is this, uh, is this just... I don't think Dragon Ball is what a lot of people say that it is, where... You know, it's just a bunch of fighting. It's not really interesting. There's no thought put into it whatsoever. No, I don't think that's the case. But at the same time, I do feel like there are some people who sort of just look uh, see too much into Dragon Ball, and they 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 basically try to find something there that doesn't exist in the first place. You know what I mean? It's like you know how in certain series you 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 criticize it because it's it, it's got a lot of problems, but then. You'll have people who try to defend it, which there's nothing wrong with that. But usually whenever they do that, they they always come up with things that aren't actually there. They come up with arguments and they try to come up with evidence to defend, the, to defend their arguments. But the evidence that they have either can easily be debunked or is something that just makes no goddamn sense. And it just feels like they made it up and they're just they're looking too much into it. Again, I don't know if that makes sense. Let me know in the comments if you if you know what I'm talking about. They change the perspective on the series entirely. <clears or, throat> excuse me. Do the same today. So you might be immediately be asking yourself, Seth, how does a character like Moro, who pulled a Frieza, pulled a Cell, pulled a Majin Buu, pulled a Babidi, pulled a Zamasu, pulled a Goldo, pulled a King Piccolo, pulled a Vegeta, hmm. pulled a pretty much everyone have any redeemable qualities he doesn't. whatsoever. He How started out Goku at first, Moro, but see, beans. when he was uh, when he was uh, like this, I thought, again, he was very, very interesting, especially because his character feels so unique. And, and I mean his character design feels so unique. But then later on, he went with that perfect self, final form Frieza looking character, and it was just... Uh, it just, it just felt so generic at this point. I just I'm sitting here and I'm wondering why, why would you do that? You had such a good design. I mean, did Toyotaro just get tired of drawing the beard? Is that it? <laughs> did he just get tired of drawing these sort of gangly, sickly arms? <sighs> Goku versus Moro, which has the Sensu Bean scene, which is still, in my opinion, the worst moment. No, actually, scratch that. This was not the worst moment. Believe me. 
I don't know if he's going to mention that. But in my opinion, there's actually a moment that's even worse than this. I fucking hate this. This is so fucking stupid. But there is a moment, in my opinion, that's a hell of a lot worse. And I don't know if he's going to mention it. But if he does, I'll elaborate on what I mean by it being worse than this. Goku trying to befriend him like a Ugh, stereotypical God, this battle, is, this overshadowing was fucking stupid. Vegeta's character, etc. have any redeemable qualities. Well, to get into that, we first need to look into the base of it all, which is, what is the point of Moro? Who is Moro? And mm -hmm. so on. Is he a generic anime bad villain? Perhaps. Not at or first. Maybe he's more than that. I think a good way to explain this is to go over the clear inspirations of the Moro arc in general. I think it's safe to say that most people would agree that Moro is in fact inspired by Galactus, both being world-eating forces of natures that consume life that is, to sustain themselves. That is, a lot of people did get that impression. Powers, that, wait, this guy, this guy reminds me a lot of Galactus. And weaken, both called the <coughs> or Excuse world me. devourer, have their heralds to scout out planets with life, etc. Most would probably agree with this on a basic level. As we know, Toyotaro and Toriyama are very aware mm -hmm. of Western media yeah. throughout their interviews, and even some of their drawings. That's true. I mean, look at all of Dragon Ball. There's, If you read original Dragon Ball, you can see there's a lot of inspiration from uh, Western media. I mean, hell, the floating cars are basically inspired by Star Wars. You know, the, uh, oh God, what are they called? The, uh, the, the land speeders. It basically inspired off the land speeders from Star Wars that we saw on Tatooine in, back in 1977. I, the movie that came out in 1977. I actually wasn't alive in 1977, but y you know what I mean. Uh, and, oh yeah, one of the androids in the Red Ribbon Army arc, one of the androids was uh, inspired by Terminator. I mean, hell, just the design alone. So yeah, uh, Toriyama's always gotten inspiration from Western media, and you can tell Toyotaro's th the same way. Thanks. <coughs> Jack Kirby, the creator of Blackest, once stated, for some reason I went so, to the- So, does anyone remember this? Let me see if I can pause this. Remember this? Remember when this whole thing came out and people accused him of, oh, oh, he's tracing? Oh, God, fucking idiots. <coughs> Jack Kirby, the creator of Galactus, once stated, for some reason I went to the Bible and I came up with Galactus. Hmm. And there I was in front of this tremendous figure who I knew very well because I've always felt him. I certainly couldn't treat him in the same way I could any ordinary mortal. And I remember in my first story, I had to back away from him to resolve that story. The Silver Surfer is, of course, the Fallen Angel. He didn't want to hmm. create some thugs or gangsters anymore. He needed something new. For Dragon Ball, Moro would be Galactus and Mirus would be the Silver Surfer also known as the fallen angel. Mm, I don't, Galactus I don't is know. often described as the ultimate I mean, danger. I don't know if it's a, 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 an exact comparison. I mean, yeah, Mirus is... Excuse me. Mirus is a... Um, again, excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, Mirus is an angel, but I, I, I don't know if he exactly serves as a herald for Moro, who is... Uh, I guess he's be, being compared to Galactus, so I don't know. Mm, eh, I mean, I get what he's going with, but eh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know about that. Fallen Angel. Galactus is often described as the ultimate danger or the final danger, an ultimate villain. Now, while Dragon Ball doesn't copy-paste Galactus here, this leads into something important later I'll discuss. You can also see this biblical-style influence of Galactus in Moro as well. With him being pretty much a literal goat-slash-ram figure, it'd be very likely to say that Moro is a very PG depiction of, say, Baphomet, which he is often shown pointing up and down when using his abilities similar to Baphomet, and as a similar and, once again, PG appearance. Goats are often referenced as very selfish hmm. creatures that embody concepts of sin and evils, whereas most religions try to teach people to be one body, hence the selfish goat is usually the antithesis of these beliefs. In this sense, Moro is a force of nature for the main characters that almost does things as if a force of evil instead. Not worrying about good or evil, but only himself. Hmm. Normally you'd argue that he is just pure evil, much say like Frieza, however Moro's justifications are that he he is not doing things just to be evil or for his ego necessarily. He genuinely feeds off of these beings and planets like an animal in the wild preys on others. But this selfishness for his own survival is what makes him evil to others. That isn't to say he isn't a cunt. Okay, Seth, so that's the basis, <laughs> and we understand he's easy, inspired easy. now. How does that 
make the actual events that happen redeemable. So, do yeah. I have a story for you? Okay. Time. Yeah! Yeah! The moral argument. I don't know what that's from. So, okay. Uh, this is going to be very, very interesting. So, again, I... He, it's 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 weird to me because a lot of the times again when it come, whenever people whenever someone like me criticizes either Dragon Ball or anything else and someone wants to defend it I I, I feel like it's I feel like a lot of the times whenever people defend it they they'll always try to say well listen you didn't get what the uh, the author was going for it's like you don't get the overall thematic elements of what he was trying to convey to us. No, no, I, I got that. Maybe not everything, you know, but again, I got the Galactus thing. I Even Mirus, you could say, yeah, sort of features Silver Surfer or whatever. And even if Moro, you know, the Ram looks like, uh, what did he say his name was? Bahamut or something? Sorry. Um, okay, fine. But at the same time, it's like none of the defenses I hear actually explain why Goku acts out of character because it's like one of the the, the criticisms for the whole Senzubin thing and maybe I'll elaborate that more when he actually gets to it but the Senzubin thing to me does not make sense based on what was already established about his character in the original Dragon Ball manga Again, I'll elaborate more on that but what I'm trying to say is that anytime someone tries to defend that they never say why, they never say how it makes sense within Goku's character or why it's not a, uh, a case of character regression because they'll always tell you you don't get what the, the writer was going for. Again, you don't get the themes. It's like, I don't, I don't give a shit about the themes. I want you to tell me why this isn't a case of character regression. Explain to me logically, using what's in front of you why this is not a case of character regression i already told you why this is a case of character regression because what was already established about this character tells me the reader that this character would not do this again in the future so if you want to explain to me why he would do this again okay but do it like that don't tell me that it makes sense because that's what the author was going for no 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 I don't care what the author is going for. It is never an excuse of plot-induced stupidity. It begins with Goku not being able to utilize Ultra Instinct. If you watched my Strength of Son Goku video, this means that Goku doesn't realize himself as much as he thinks he does, and he might have been brought to that character arc or mindset on accident against Jiren. For Goku to advance, he needs to consciously understand what actually happened, thus introducing Miris, who is a strange galactic patrol member who can even subdue Goku so, and catch Vegeta by surprise. Yeah, that was Vegeta, in, uh, who is known to a clip from the anime, I'm hoping. Miris then informs them that, they need uh, Majin Buu to unleash the Grand Supreme Kai and seal away a powerful enemy with no mm -hmm. limits to his power, known as Moro, who has fled from prison. Goku then searches for Moro himself and finds him, but Moro can backtrack anybody that senses him and immediately senses they are looking for him. Immediately, you can see there is a slight difference in Moro. Instead of the usual Supreme Kai, we are now working with the Grand Supreme Kai. And this spell will not be caught off guard like many enemies before. He is immediately aware of anybody seeking him. His aura is also different. Instead of just being a strong key, Moro's key is the souls of everyone and every planet he's ever devoured, screaming in pain. And when you sense him, you can feel and hear this pain itself. Off the bat, he is eerie, in a similar sense to First Form Cell, after devouring a lot of humans, but on a mm -hmm. higher scale. Moro was also sealed off just like King Piccolo and re-emerges much older and weaker. He also has a ship similar to him as well. Mm -hmm. Just like exactly. Piccolo, Moro seeks the Dragon Balls and to that's, return to his me, powers, that's one of the just problems like Riza, of the he seeks them on Namek. In the fact, constant rehashes of what's already Moro come sought before. The Dragon Balls on Namek exactly like Frieza because one of Frieza's soldiers that are with him told him the story. Later, Goku and Vegeta have contact with Moro, and Moro recognizes the talent and powers of them. We then learn Moro is a master of illusions and magic, like Deborah and Babidi, and defeats Goku and Vegeta by using his absorption powers, like the androids, but on a higher scale. During the fight, Moro actually tries a similar attack as Goldo using sharpened trees and telekinesis, which Vegeta actually calls him out for and mocks him for. 
Moro is also shown then using the spirit bomb concept, but against them. It might be interesting to note he might actually be the originator of this sort of technique entirely. The attack that brings everyone together to destroy evil foes is actually a variation of Dragon Ball Satan's ultimate jutsu, which once again is important. The beginning fights and moments for this arc are actually focused on developing Again, Vegeta. I, uh... For instance, Moro says at full power, I would crush you like a bug to bait Vegeta, but Vegeta says he doesn't care and wants to kill him instead. Obviously, a clear contrast to how he was in the Android arc, or the Cell arc. Vegeta also wants to actively atone and protect Namek, rather than just seek a strong opponent for his pride. I don't want to talk about Vegeta too much here, but just know that that's what a lot of this arc is. But this video is focusing on Goku versus Moro, not necessarily Vegeta. After defeating Goku yeah. and Vegeta, Moro seeks the villages of Namek just like Frieza, but he is a higher caliber and doesn't need a scouter to do so. Nobody can hide from Moro like they could from Frieza. He will absolutely obtain the Dragon Balls unless directly confronted. Namekian warriors come to stop Moro, just like they did Frieza, but this time they fuse together into a super warrior. Moro then proceeds to kill them without even looking at him. Once again, a step above. So, my only question is, why didn't he just heal? I thought Namekians had the ability to heal. I thought, unless the head is damaged, they can heal any... anything. Yeah, um... Mm. Just like the monster, this always confused me. In Piccolo, they want the Grand Supreme Kai to seal away Moro again. Majin Buu then comes in and faces Moro and beats on him in a similar way he beat Majin Vegeta back in the day. Which, in all honesty, doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because, remember how later on it was established that a, a big portion of the power of that the Grand Supreme Kai had actually went into the uh, Kid Buu or Pure Buu, and that the Fat Majin Buu didn't have any of that power. So, how the hell is he able to compete with Moro, who absorbed the power of Goku and Vegeta, Goku and Vegeta combined being way, way stronger than the Boo that they fought at the end of the Boo arc. Like, that makes no goddamn sense. Okay, however, Moro still has more up his sleeve after making excuses like Second Form Cell did after losing, which Boo makes fun of him for. Moro also has a habit of stabbing people. See, again, that makes no goddamn sense. It's like he shouldn't have even been able to put up a fight against him. People like Dr. Jero did. And notice how he keeps keeps mentioning how this happened just like what happened in the past, just like what happened with Frieza, just like what happened with Cell, just like what happened with uh, the androids. And it's like, that's my biggest problem. It's the constant rehashes of what happened before. Yamcha, which he does brutally numerous times throughout this arc. Like yeah, again. Cell, Moro can also hide his power to flee and seek more power from fighting Majin Buu. The Grand Supreme Kai then revives Goku and Vegeta, with the cast constantly referring to Moro as the villain. The Grand Supreme Kai fighting Moro is important because it's almost like a God versus Satan style battle. This was somewhat hinted at in the Buu Saga as well, but in this stage, it's more legitimate than before, featuring the actual Grand Supreme Kai at his full abilities and Dragon Ball Baphomet. Another interesting quality Moro has. Is Baphomet, that that's what it was. I thought it was Bahamut. I don't know what it's others it. and learned that the Grand Supreme Kai's powers were obliterated with Kid Buu many years ago not even planning and thinking to yourself in solitude are safe from Moro there really is nothing that can kind of escape him Majin Buu fighting Moro is also very important so keep that note in your so okay hold on this is interesting I just realized so he, he took a look at his uh, memories and found out that he doesn't have that power so if he could do that why didn't he do that against Vegeta when he came to fight him like, why didn't he look at his memories and see, oh, okay, so oh, so that's what you have planned. And then he could work a stra work up a strategy against him. It's like, do, do, do you see what I mean? It's like there are so many instances of characters just completely forgetting that they can do things just for the sake of the plot. That can kind of escape him. Majin Buu fighting Moro is also very important, so keep that note in your head. After winning another skirmish, Moro wants to let all the strong fighters roam around and do as they please after sparing them, and believes they will return to him, just like Goku Black and Zamasu did to Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks. In fact, later, once he learns they are training, he wants to allow them to train so that he can devour more energy from them, a similar thing that Perfect Cell did with the Cell games. 
For once in Vegeta's life, he realizes that physical might won't be the end all to winning a fight, and wants to find a way around this. Goku then begins training with Mirus. Mirus teaches Goku Ultra Instinct is the opposite of everything that has carried the Saiyans to where they are. It is the opposite of rage, grief, and joy that translated to prodigious power. Everything the characters have used to this point to win will not work against Moro anymore. The characters need to change. Mirus and Goku then train in a hyperbolic time chamber that isn't as exaggerated as the one on Earth. Instead of one day per year, it's one day for three days. So with the two months they have to train for Moro, thanks to Jacko, Goku has six months. Once again, this is upping the stakes compared to Cell, which against Cell, both Goku and Vegeta had a year, with Goku taking a little less time than that on purpose. Also like with Cell, they are training for the time that Moro granted them to mm -hmm. grow stronger to please his needs. Mirus and Goku also get to know each other very well in the hyperbolic time chamber, which I will go into later. Mirus also hints that Goku will need to be mentally shocked or put into a deathly situation to truly have to calmly access Ultra Instinct from his shock. Foreshadowing. We then learn that Whis has been watching this whole time and reports this to the Grand Priest. It is revealed that Mirus is in fact an angel in training, but he is a troublemaker who has begun to sympathize with mortals too much due to his time in the Galactic Patrol. Whis, fearing for Mirus, comes to take him back to the godly realms, and the training with Goku is stopped short before he can go all out versus him. Goku then proceeds to get lost in space and ask directions from space squids or something. We then introduce... <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, that moment did kind of make me laugh. It, it, it just felt so Goku. An artificial life form with infinite stamina. Sound familiar? It faces mm -hmm. down against Piccolo... Yes, very familiar. Again one of my problems too Goku familiar and is inevitably stopped by android 17 and 18 who 73 can't steal and absorb the powers of the androids fighting 73 is important so keep another note of that moro then lands on earth the time is up when he lands he exclaims a new level of power and shows that he can empower his henchmen to the point they literally explode just like babidi could in the fight goku begins to use ultra instinct sign or omen we'll call it sign for now in sign he is in a technique of the gods that makes moro very excited and during the battle moro uses a technique similar to kefla in which he shoots lightning all over while goku dodges while utilizing a kamehameha or charging a kamehameha this one is weird since kefla only really did that versus goku in the mm, gotta kind of be careful here uh, okay anime but we'll give it a pass in a symbolic sense and say that's what they were referencing we then see Oh, okay, it's done. He parallels in Goku versus Moro, similar to Goku fighting mm -hmm. many other characters, in which Moro blocks Goku's Kamehameha, just like Frieza. Just like Frieza, yeah. Power did Again. Power, again, times 20 Goku. And just like that fight, Moro is not at full power, and Goku's stamina is draining rapidly with his technique or current form he is using, and he can't hold out like this. Also, this is going to be a tad off topic from what I'm going for, but people really get mad here that Goku yells when he powers up against Moro, which I'm assuming most of them are a bunch of nerds, no offense, but they get mad because Ultra Instinct is supposed to be a calm mind, the opposite of rage, grief, and joy. However, yelling does not mean you aren't calm of mind or filled with rage, grief, and joy. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I would agree with that. Yelling here is more like if I had to explain when you lift heavy weights and you yell or make noises instinctually that helps you kind of motivate your body. It has nothing to do with him being like in an angry state of mind or something. It's like questioning why someone yells out in pain when they get punched. What? Goku just screamed when he got punched in the mouth? Not my that Jedi just groaned in pain when he got kicked in the face. Is he succumbing to the dog? Oh, come on, did you have to show me this? Dark side? <laughs> Making these noises can, in fact, be instinctual. Not only that, but Goku isn't even in the completed Ultra Instinct form to begin with. Anyway, before I go on to a longer tangent... When are y'all gonna get to the goddamn point? Goku and Moro's yes. auras class just like they did in Goku vs. Piccolo Jr., obviously on a more intense and larger degree. Goku then gets throttled trying to rely on power like he did against Jiren, showing he perhaps really didn't understand why he truly did what he did in the Tournament of Power after all. This power-up attempt actually nerfs Goku instead of empowering him, as he isn't...
isn't listening to Miras' teachings on how Ultra Instinct work. Beerus then overhears Miras and Whis talking about the fight and learns Goku will not win. Beerus then says he wants to go to Earth for food. Many people question Beerus here. One thing about the gods is that they have to act on their biases towards mortals in a very subtle way. Beerus in this case usually claims he only wants to help Goku in the game because of food, but we learn it's a bit deeper than that which is shown later in this arc. Whis is pretty similar, but much more subtle as he has to be. I'll get into this more later as well. Vegeta then goes full circle and uses his new spirit fission ability he learned on Yardrat on Moro to give him a harder time than Goku did, showing a higher level of development as both a fighter and a character, sacking his pride in what he knew about fighting to try and genuinely learn how to get the victory and to atone himself. Now while Vegeta getting the win against Moro could have been fine here, it doesn't allow Goku to grow, and once again misses the point of numerous arcs leading up to this, with everyone's strength becoming your strength and so on. Too much of a spit on the series for it to happen, unfortunately. I don't think it would have been really a, a spit on the series. I, I, again, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, again, it's like, to me, it just feels like you, you went through the trouble of having Vegeta learn this, and yet you never really pay it off well. And, and that moment near the end with the spirit bomb thing empowering Goku, and it's like, oh God, like that's it? You just reduce him to a supporting role again? In Vegeta's defense, he did outdo Goku pretty hard, having less training and still doing better. But I could talk about Vegeta... And let me know in the comments. Oh, okay. In his own video, if you guys want, I want to focus on. Well, Goku. so far, from During what I understand, night... he still hasn't made the video, so I guess people didn't really ask for it. I mean, I could check the comments later. Maybe I'm wrong. With Vegeta, Moro understands that they are both villains bound for hell. Both Moro and Vegeta are content with this and don't care. A lot of people question if Vegeta's really a villain. I say if you've murdered a million babies in the past and you haven't done it for 30 years, you're probably still considered a bad person. But. Well, not necessarily. Remember. At the end of the Boo arc, they said, bring back, uh, you know, bring back everyone except evil people. Vegeta wasn't in that category. So I would say, yeah, no, I, I guess at least in the eyes of Shenron, he's not evil anymore. Now, you could still make the argument that because of all the people Vegeta brutally murdered in cold blood, then yeah, he is still bound for hell as punishment for what he did. Then OK, but I would say as of now, no, I wouldn't consider him a villain. There is debates to be had if Vegeta's actually a villain or not. He's, he's in the shoes of a good person at the moment, but he still has to atone and did bad things. That's basically what they're talking about. Also, Piccolo comments that Vegeta has genuinely changed thanks to Goku, but claims Goku's outlook on fighting is generally the same. I don't believe that Piccolo is saying Goku hasn't changed as a person at all, but more so why he fights is pretty much the same. I'll go into this more later. Piccolo also says Vegeta is not one to underestimate his opponents, which... There's a whole debate about that. It's, it's wrong. That's what it is. It's wrong. It's just wrong. Oh, God. This was so fucking stupid. So many memes. I'm not going to try to defend it in this video. Moro that consumes 7-3 cell style and achieves his perfect Voro form. Moro also copied Vegeta's abilities, but they are permanent, making him immune to which, fusion, unlike any other character in the series, so no Vegito or Gogeta to save the day. Once which doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because it's like, okay, but why is it that when he absorbed him, that, that limit just immediately disappeared? There's, there's no explanation for that. It's like, it's like, imagine if someone copies another person's ability. Normally, you would think you would also copy that person's weaknesses. Like, for example, look at, um, what is it? Uh, look at Amazo from DC Comics. Amazo has the ability to copy other people's abilities, but not just that, you also get their weaknesses. So if he copies Superman's strength or Superman's powers, he also gets Superman's weaknesses. Like, for example, his... Uh, weakness to kryptonite and magic it's like I, I don't understand why when moro absorbed 73 that limitation was all of a sudden gone also this whole thing of moro constantly grabbing people by the back of the neck despite constantly being warned that this guy's ability and it wasn't just moro but it was the same thing with 73 and i just it was, I, it, it, it was stupid. I'm sorry, there's no other way to say it. It was stupid. You were warned explicitly that this guy goes for the neck to try to copy your abilities. And yet, he, it somehow keeps happening. The first time, I understand because you didn't know. But the second time, after you've been warned, there's no excuse for that. I'm sorry. 
Once again, another step up from other antagonists. Moro also gains the ability to regenerate, and after having his arm blasted off like Zamasu, simply grows it back and almost kills Goku in one hit. Also, someone else pointed this out, and this is actually very, very true. I can't believe I didn't think about this. So you know how later on, when Mira shows up and says his goal is to destroy the gems that are on, that are on Moro that that allows him to copy abilities in order to give Goku and uh, you know the others a better chance so his arm gets destroyed and we know his arm has one of those gems and yet he was able to just grow it back with the gem seemingly intact so why doesn't he just do that again why doesn't he just destroy his arm grow it back and then later on when Mirus cuts off his hand that hand still has the gem intact, but he grows back his hand and his, the gem is still there. So I don't understand why he doesn't just regen the uh, the broken gem. All of a sudden now it's like once it's broken, that's it, it's gone. It's like, how does that make any goddamn sense? Goku in one hit. Thanks to Beerus coming to Earth, Mirus steps in and dukes it out with Moro. For the time being, Mirus is using earthly tools and isn't genuinely fighting Moro yet, so he is safe. But he isn't able to fully hold off the new empowered Moro off with just his mortal powers. Moro then tags Mirus and gets a... Okay, I, I can't believe I didn't notice this. Let's just go back for a second. But look, there's a mistake here. Toyotaro forgot to draw on the gem on his uh, on his palm. Bit of a mistake with Toyotaro. I can't believe I never noticed this. Mortal powers. Moro then tags Mirus and gets a grab on his okay, neck. Okay, which... again, again. It's like you guys know... This guy goes for the neck. You would think that they would have a constant watch over here. But it keeps happening. It's like... I Again, I, I hate whenever this happens. I hate whenever the plot makes characters be stupid just so the plot can happen. Miras activates his angel powers to break free from. This hand then plops down like Buhan's tentacle versus Vegito back... Which, again, this guy says his goal is to destroy the gems. He sees one right there, dude, destroy it. In the Buu Saga, this angel staff causes Miras to start to lose his form, and Goku begins to worry for Miras, telling him to stop. Miras then reveals the thing he wants to teach Goku is justice, something what? Goku never really cared about before. Goku did always have the, hey, knock it off attitude whenever he saw someone do something bad, but he never truly sought out. Sorry, pause for a sec. Why was his nose drawn weird? What what the, what the hell happened here? First of all, this should be a little bit higher up. It should be somewhere over here. And uh, why does it look like his nose is broken? I don't, I don't know. That's just... Mm. But he never truly sought out peace on Earth or to prevent these bad things from ever happening again for the most part. Most of his fights were just life and death battles in which he got very excited and emotional. Term I wonder if I'm going to get in trouble for these. Eh, here's hoping I, I, here's hoping I don't get dinged boils happen and blah 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 this is described in a flashback in which miris asks goku why he actually fights miris says goku has saved the universe many times in which goku says he hasn't thought of it very much and that the strongest guys tend to be villain mm, again i don't I, I, i've never really agreed with that well yeah it's true a lot of them a lot of them are people he fought because he wanted to fight but what about king piccolo it's like he knew that guy was uh, was evil he stopped him and Frieza, he also knew that he also knew because if he left, if Frieza was left alive, then Frieza could not only kill him, he'll, he'll also kill his friends and he'll possibly kill, destroy the earth. So he had to stop him. I mean, I'd say that's pretty heroic. Now, one could make the argument that maybe it's actually a little bit selfish of, of Goku because he was just looking out for his family and friends. But I don't know. I mean, he's he's saved the earth multiple times and he's actually cared about the earth so i don't know where this thing of goku was really only doing it because you know he wanted to strike fight the, the strongest guys and the strongest guys just so happened to be villains i i don't know i just I, i've never really agreed with this and again what about in the uh, the cell arc when he said he wanted to stay on earth because he thought that the earth was always in danger because of you know him because a lot of the villains usually are after him so i would say that's a that's kind of a selfless thing to do especially since he knew that gohan was there and gohan had already 
by, by only nine years old, he already far eclipsed him in power. He thought he would only get a lot stronger by the, by the time he gets older. So, granted, Toriyama kind of forgot about that, which kind of sucks. Uh, not really. I mean, he, he did change his mind. Although, in my opinion, he kind of changed his mind too quickly on Gohan being the protagonist. I mean, I thought, dude, at least give it like 10 chapters. You, you changed it in like two. Whatever. That's neither here nor there. But, yeah, I, I would say that that pretty much says that he's a hero. That's pretty heroic behavior, choosing not to come back to life because you believe it's for the safety of the earth and the people you care about. And I, I don't know. I don't know. It's just to me, I... Um, I don't. Know, I guess. I guess. I just never really bought this. I, I don't understand where this narrative even came from. Well, actually, I, I do kind of know. It's uh, Toriyama did say in an interview, which I mean, he is the author. He is the one who created the character. But I don't know. It's just your your own work kind of says that he says kind of goes against what you said. So. Mm. Mirus then asks Goku why he spares villains, in which Goku says if they rise up and do bad stuff again, he'll have to become stronger, and he will fight them as many times as it takes until maybe one day they join the good side. Goku thinks Mirus gives him way too much credit, and that he only does it because it's just more exciting. Well, Mirus sees this, but still has something to- I mean, see, again, I don't, I don't know if I agree with that. I feel that it's kind of recontextualizing certain scenes, like when he spared Piccolo, I thought the real reason why he did that, yeah, it's because, you know, he gets to fight him again, but I thought the real reason why he did that was because if Piccolo dies, then Kami dies, and he didn't want Kami to, to die. And also, if Kami dies, then the Dragon Balls are, are gone. And he spared Vegeta, okay, yeah, he spared Vegeta because he wanted to fight him again, so, okay, I'll, I'll give him that. But someone like Frieza, he thought, I, that was a moment of Goku just letting his better nature get the best of him. But then later on, he realized, okay, yeah, uh, it's it's obvious this guy's not going to change. So he took him out, or at least what he thought, or at least he thought he took him out. And then later on, when it comes to Cell, notice how with with Cell he didn't have that attitude. He immediately kept imploring Gohan to kill him, you know, to kill him now because he remembered from his fight with Frieza that people who get desperate usually do crazy things. So he kept tell, trying to tell Gohan, no, 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 get rid of this guy now, and then. Later on with Majin Buu, same thing. He realized, okay, yeah, this guy is a problem. He needs to, uh, he needs to get rid of them, or at the very least, help Goten and Trunks and Gohan get rid of this threat because he knew he was only going to be on Earth for one day. So I don't know. Mm. Again, I uh, it's just to me, this just feels like they're trying to recontextualize what already happened. To teach Goku, Mirus uses his full angel powers to eliminate Moro's copy ability. He begins to fade away and says, I've come to love this galaxy, this universe full of excitement. Please protect it all. And vanishes from existence. Mirus gives his entire existence to teach Goku to value justice and the universe that gives him excitement. And this message is not lost on Goku. Goku realizes that he shouldn't just be fighting for his own gain or simply excitement, but for others as well. He somewhat already did this naturally throughout the series, but now he is more consciously doing it. Miris and Jacko talk about how the Galactic Patrol reform and protects, and this chapter is now called Goku Galactic Patrol, and acknowledges his duty to protect the universe for the first time, and that Miris' will still lives on with him. Goku remembers and finally achieves Ultra Instinct's full power once again, but now it is more perfected than ever before. Goku well, easily not so much thrashes now, more, but a new example of Goku's character must begin. Goku thrashes more on a level that impresses even the gods, and is called godlike by even Beerus, who respects Goku's new ability, which Whis is even surprised to hear. Moro starts calling himself the supreme life form on some perfect cell energy, and Goku mm -hmm. lectures him about if he knows what it's like to be hurt like he did to others. So, just want to talk about this for a second. I can't be the only one who, who sees this. And again, it goes back to what I said was my biggest problem with this arc, is the constant rehashing of what's already happened before. Again, you guys had to see, you guys have to see it, right? Mirus giving up his life, saying that he's loved this galaxy, and asking Goku to protect it right before he goes. It's like, does that not sound familiar? And then later on, Goku gets a power up. It's. I can't, I can't. Do I even need to say anything else? 
I, I think I said it in my review of this chapter is that it's, it's exactly the same as what happened with Gohan in 16. And then later on, Goku goes on to thrash Moro, just like what happened with Gohan and Cell. And then Gohan makes a mistake, he gets arrogant, and then it ends up backfiring, cause, nearly causing the destruction of the Earth, just like Moro against Goku. It's, it's the same. The entire arc is literally the same. Or at least the ending is the same as Super Saiyan 2 Gohan versus Cell. It's... Wow, okay. Yeah, let's... I, I feel like that's all I need to say on this. It's... Let's just move forward. So the Supreme yep. Life Form same thing, same perfect thing. Just like how Perfect Cell lost his mind. Him about if he knows what it's like to be hurt like he did to others, similar to what he says to Frieza. He asked Moro to come to jail peacefully, That's... similar to what he said to Frieza or what Vegito says to. No, he didn't say the thing. He didn't say that to Frieza. He said he was going to leave him alive because he thought that the pain of losing to what he considered to be a lower life form was better than just being killed because he knows how arrogant Frieza is. That's what he was doing. He wasn't sparing him. Well, later on he did later on he did spare him unfortunately, which I I I, uh, God, I, I, I still didn't like that if I'm being honest. I thought that was stupid. Which yeah, he did spare him later on, but his initial reason for not killing him was basically trying to again do to him what he thought was even worse than killing him. Because, again, he knows how arrogant Frieza is. He knows that he constantly looks down on Saiyans. And he thought that living his life knowing that he lost to what he presumed to be lower life forms, you know, than him, would be even worse. That's why he did that. But then later on, when Frieza, of course, uh, couldn't let it go, he felt like, okay, he had no choice. He had to put the guy down. Wuhan. He asks Moro to come to jail peacefully, in which Moro obviously refuses. Goku then asks oh what God, the collective coming. control would do here. It's, it's on its Jacko way. Get ready for a rant. Moro now. Goku then says he quits the galactic patrol That's... and wants to face Moro as an earthling. This isn't to disrespect Miris, by the way, as Goku later says he must face Moro to protect the galaxy and Miris' honor. But imagine the next set of events is Goku's answer to Miris' lesson and his question in the hyperbolic time chamber. This begins by Goku giving Moro a sensu bean. Many people this is immediately it, get mad at this, thinking that Goku is making the same mistakes For as a good he did reason. Itself. However, that is not what is happening at all. Yes, the it is. The problem with Goku giving the bean to Cell is that Goku is trying to prove his successor could defeat the past generation of fighters in Cell and was willing to heal Cell and possibly torment Gohan to prove it. In this instance, it is more similar to what he did with Piccolo Jr., in which Goku is actively trying to give Moro a chance at redemption. Just out of curiosity, does anyone kind of miss when Dragon Ball looked like this? I don't know. To me, it's just maybe it's just nostalgia, but... Eh. I mean, I guess that's one thing that I did kind of like about the Broly movie is that it sort of emulated what Dragon Ball looked like here, back when you could say Toriyama was kind of at his prime when Dragon Ball, the Dragon Ball manga in terms of art was basically better than it has ever been. And it did kind of, it did kind of lower in quality for me. Not that it was bad. Don't, don't get me wrong. The art was still good. Toriyama is still a genius when it comes to drawing. But I don't know, for me, just kind of, uh, it, it just, it was never as good as the World Martial Arts Tournament. I think this was the, uh, the 21st, if I remember correctly, or the 22nd. And... No, I think this was the 23rd, if I remember correctly. Yeah, because there was one after that where Hercule won, and then the one that where they competed in was the 25th. So yeah, this was technically the 23rd. I don't know, it's just the 23rd World Martial Arts Tournament and the Saiyan arc, to me, was kind of peak Dragon Ball, at least when it comes to the art in the manga. A little bit, early, little bit early on in the Frieza arc, but then the, the start of the Artificial Humans arc, and then the Boo arc was just, you can kind of tell that Toriyama was kind of just getting tired. Like, he just kind of wanted to end it. And even in the Boo arc, which I think it's kind of clear if you read it, you can tell Toriyama wasn't really taking it all that seriously because he wasn't, 
and again, keep in mind, I'm not saying it was bad, but it just felt like he wasn't putting as much effort into it as he was the uh, the uh, the arc before, or the Saiyan arc, or the Freeze arc, or the tournament arc, or even just early Dragon Ball, which I guess does make sense because he was still, you know, a lot younger when he started Dragon Ball. And obviously, as you get older, you start to slow down. You're not, you don't perform as well as you used to in your prime, which that's just natural. It happens to all of us. So I guess from that perspective, it does kind of make sense. So. Sorry, I just went off on a tangent ever since I saw this. Just really, really miss old school Dragon Ball art. Which, again, I, I, I really appreciated the, uh, the the Broly movie because it felt like it kind of brought it back, you know, back to what it looked like. Redemption, just like he did against Piccolo after their fight. This has nothing to do with Cell. It isn't even referencing Cell. This is also important, which I will outline later. Moro then pulls a Frieza when Super Saiyan Goku gave him energy on Namek, and Goku easily knocks away his attack, and Moro even snaps his hand on Goku's body, trying to test his mercy. Goku then asks Moro if he's ever trained, but Moro responds, it's a crutch for the weak. Goku says it's a shame because he's stronger than anybody he's ever fought. Video note here, there is a debate if toughest means strongest, which I would argue it is referring to Moro being the strongest due to Goku talking about villains being the strongest guys he's ever fought before but if you want to take it as goku just saying he's a tough guy that is fine too thumbs up both work for the narrative of a hand i'm not claiming one or the other moro then pulls a Buhan oh boy and absorbs miris's power from the hand mm, okay oh boy oh boy oh boy oh boy oh boy we gotta talk about this we gotta talk about this i told you a rant was coming i told you a rant was coming sorry let yeah. me just moro then okay Okay, hold on. I, I can't do this seriously with my headphones on, so I'm gonna need to set them aside. This moment, this moment, oh my fucking God. I, again, the Senzu bean was bad, was bad enough. And I, I get what, what Seth is trying to say. I don't necessarily agree, but I get what he's trying to say. But this moment, in my opinion, there's nothing you can tell me that defends this. Let me see if I get this straight. First of all, Mira's cutting off the hand, not destroying the gem, stupid, since that, that, since that was the whole reason why he even came here in the first place. <sighs> okay, the hand, which is just lying there, okay, just lying there on the ground, everybody forgot about it, and he references the, uh, the Buhan, what happened with uh, Majin Buu and, uh, what was it, when he absorbed uh, Gohan. First of all, there it was stupid enough on its own, here. So you're telling me that the entire time when Goku and Moro were fighting, all of the explosions, all of the force that's been that's being exerted from their fight, especially that one moment where Goku decides to do that fucking Shoryuken into Moro's gut that causes a force strong enough that it vibrates all throughout the fucking planet, somehow that wasn't enough to completely destroy the hand or at the very least blow it completely away to maybe the other side of the planet. You're, uh, you're telling me somehow it managed to survive that. And then later on when Moro does this fucking volcanic eruption thing that he always does. Somehow the hand doesn't disintegrate. Even though we saw when Goku kicked Moro through it, it severely damaged his body. And yet somehow his hand is perfectly fine. It's, it, it somehow didn't get destroyed. Somehow this one piece of rock just happens to be fine. It doesn't get destroyed. Even though everything around it is destroyed. And then the, the, the rock just conveniently, conveniently happens to be right in Moro's eyesight. Are you freaking kidding me? Like, I, dude, there's plot convenience and then there's just bullshit. This wasn't convenience from the author. This was bullshit. Okay, I, I, I don't care what you try, what you try to say. There is nothing, nothing that can defend this. This was fucking retarded. Okay. I, out of everything in the arc, there's a lot of stupid shit that happens in the arc. This, in my opinion, was the stupidest thing. This, in my opinion, felt like the author thinking that you are a fucking moron and that you don't have an IQ higher than two, and he just thinks that, oh, you're just going to accept it. No, fuck this shit. Fuck Toyotaro for this. This was fucking stupid. Out of everything in the arc, this was the most fucking stupid thing that ever happened. Fuck this. God, I just, oh my, oh my God, this was so fucking stupid. I just, I, I can't, I can't believe there was no one who, who tried to talk to him and said, hey, d d don't you think this maybe, maybe doesn't really make a lot of sense? 
may, maybe you want to think about this. If you really want this to happen, don't you think you could have at least th thought of it another way? And it's just, again, this is, this is exactly what I'm referring to. I hate whenever we, there is just a case of plot-induced stupidity. First of all, Miris not destroying the gem makes no sense since you established that that was the whole reason why he even came here on Earth. And how the hand just didn't get destroyed in their fight somehow, again, no fucking sense. Moro raising the fucking volcano, somehow the, the piece of rock that the hand is on, somehow is just fine. And then, of course, it just conveniently happens to be in Moro's eyesight, right when he needs it the most, right when he's about to die. Fuck this fucking bullshit. I don't care what narrative themes that there are that they're trying to defend with it. There is no defending this. This was fucking stupid. So there it is. I, I, I told you there was a rant coming, so... Uh, let's move forward, shall we? Then pulls a Buhan and absorbs Miris' power from the hand dropped from earlier. By the way, I called this on stream months in advance. I'm actually a god, thank you. Goku now has to surpass Miris, or in a less physical sense, the Galactic Patrol, and prove his answer is correct while Moro utilizes Ultra Instinct. After a long battle and many more villain references, Moro goes giant perfect cell mode and begins mm -hmm. to freak out as his body can't withstand angel powers anymore. Whis warns Goku to finish Moro off now, or else things will get out of hand. And before he can, Moro fuses with the Earth like fusions of Masu fused with the universe in the anime. Although mm -hmm. this time, it's not on a larger scale. And Let's pause for a second. This seems to be more of an extension to second form cell about to self-destruct the Earth. So you gotta, you, you guys know. Earth than Zamasu. As Goku can't just teleport. Just for a second. Okay. Moro away like he could sell, thus raising the stakes. Beerus comes in and resolves himself to help seal Moro away, once again proving what I said earlier, and even Whis, the unbiased angel, biasly gives Goku advice on how to defeat Moro. Whis also tells Goku to have faith in his own strength, but this fails, and Goku cannot stop Moro alone. This is because, as we learned in my last video, Goku's strength is the strength of others becoming his own, which we may not fully understand. Doesn't doesn't Goku always say that he hates when other people help him get strength because it's not technically his own? He didn't work to earn it. Remember, he said that in Battle of Gods that one thing he hated about the God form is that uh, you know other people had to help him get it that he didn't work to get it on his own. I don't know understand or maybe Whis was referencing that strength and he's actually incredibly based everyone comes together to repower goku including oob the reincarnation of evil boo and goku shatters moro which brings a smile to Whis's face miris is then revived in exchange for his angel powers and fulfills the you know what no i already went on one rant one one's enough the whole fallen angel thing i talked about earlier i'll now wrap this up for those that don't get it Moro is the amalgamation or representation of every villain Goku and gang have ever faced. He is the villain trope personified. In a simple wasn't didn't Cell already represent that that him being like a representation or an amalgamation of all the villains that came before. So isn't Moro technically just a rehash of a already done rehash? Okay, wh whatever. In a similar way Jiren was the representation of Goku and what he thought he wanted, Moro is the representation of Goku's struggles, villains, and developments. This is why Moro kept seemingly almost purposely doing what every past villains were doing. Some people call this lazy, it and they is. know that Toriyama and Toyotaro can't avoid repeating tropes and be creative. But this time, they went out of their way to not only blatantly copy, but even reference what they were copying literally when it happens. Within their own story this alongside the galactus inspiration of being the ultimate danger and villain is exactly what moro is the ultimate villain or danger for goku to show his answer to but something you'll notice is that many of these characters that criticize goku were villains as well 
Piccolo, the reincarnation of evil, Vegeta, the Saiyan prince, the androids built to torment and destroy, and even Majin Buu, the being who almost annihilated the whole universe, even Frieza, the emperor of evil, defended the universe during the tournament of power. And finally, after it all, Goku selfish does- This, this fucking thing. I'm not even gonna... Okay. Desire for excitement and evil Boo's reincarnation comes in the form of Boob, what most would call one of Goku's biggest mistakes and allowing Kid Boo to even appear now becomes his greatest strength and greatest tool in def Did he allow Kid Boo to appear? I don't, I don't think so. Because they didn't know. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't know that Boo was gonna show up. Bending the universe. Oh wait, is he talking about the fat boo when he fought Goku and when he fought Vegeta? Hmm. I don't know. If he's referencing the fat boo, then okay. But if he's talking about Kid Boo, just I thought it was weird. He said allowing Boo to appear, and he just showed the uh, this version of Boo, which is hmm. anyway. Bending the universe. Just felt a little he weird. Destroys Moro. If you still don't get it with that, Goku's answer to the Galactic Patrol and even Miris, is that reforming and teaching others, including villains, to value the excitement of the universe can help defend the universe and justice even more than they can. Goku's lesson is now complete. He now values justice, protecting others, and understands that working together with all, including those who people think are worthless villains, is his final answer, and it wasn't Goku that saved the universe numerous times, but this lesson. Yeah, again, it's like, I don't, here's the thing, here's the thing. I get if a writer wants to inject some themes into the story. I, I get it, I do. However, however, I don't like it when it's done in a stupid way. That's the problem. Yes, there are, again, you get what the writer is going for, you do. But that doesn't mean there aren't holes. That doesn't mean there aren't inconsistencies. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases of just blatant stupidity on the uh, on the uh, on the hands of the characters, which is only which only happens because of the writers. Again, if the uh, decision that a character has made is stupid, if it makes sense with the character, like for example, Vegeta allowing Perfect Cell to. Uh, or excuse me, allowing Cell to absorb 18 and get his perfect form. While yes, it's stupid, it is in line with his character. It was Vegeta giving in to his Saiyan nature. It made sense. <sighs> so, this thing that happened with the, the whole Senzu bean, that did not make sense. Because at this point, Goku should have known better. Goku should have known that there are some characters that just cannot be redeemed. And the whole thing about the lesson that, uh, again, Miris is trying to teach Goku, I would say that Goku already learned this lesson. We've seen multiple times that Goku does value life. He does value justice. Maybe not to the extent that some people would like him to, be, would like him to have, but he still had it. So that's why, to me, this whole thing doesn't really make a lot of sense. Because it's like you're trying to teach Goku a lesson that he already learned. It's just, yeah, again, I don't know. Look, if you agree with Seth, then okay, great. But me personally, I just, again, I just, I, I don't agree. I still don't like the arc. I'm sorry. I still think this is stupid. You just heard me go on a fucking rant. I just... Oh boy. Anyway, guys, just let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Like, share, subscribe, all that YouTube stuff. Bye for now.